Oh, fantastic. Oh, Dr. Martin's up. Okay, leave the questions until Appreciate later. You. Thank Please you. use the app to put your questions in. It will make our session more interactive. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions that uh, others may have the same ones. So please feel free. No question is a silly question. May I start? Okay. So um, no worries. I'm not here to convince you about anything. So uh, I was asked to give an overview about the uh, LASIK procedure. Um, well, it was introduced in the 1990s by Pal uh, Palikaris, uh, a Greece guy. Uh, worldwide, we are guessing that's between 50 and 100 million people already treated with LASIK. And there was an evolution, as you know, from microkeratome to femtosecond laser. So it's a three-step procedure, as you know. So first creation of a flap, either with femtosecond laser or microkeratome. I'm not sure if anyone in this audience is still using microkeratomes. Raise your hands. One, two, okay. Um, then lift the flap and the excimer laser treatment. You can use a bandage contact lens if you like. So um, we basically need two laser platforms, so a femtosecond laser platform and an excimer laser platform. You're all familiar with this procedure, I'm sure. Um, I'm using uh, the, the size uh, Visomax uh, for the um, flap creation. If I do the LASIK, I do a, a approximately 110 microns flap thickness. And here's the ablation, and then we close the flap, and that's it. So we can skip that, I guess. What about the ablation profiles? So the first one and the basis for the most other uh, profiles was the Smanderline profile. We already heard it before in the talk. Uh, but it's uh, still somehow available, but only recommended in small optical zones. Uh, then we have this aspheric profiles. So um, it, it's supposed to have less induction of spherical aberration and glare, especially when the flying spot lasers came up. And we have customized treatments. So we have wavefront guided treatments. So. The, the goal was this eager eye, so the, the vision should be better after LASIK than before. So there was not really an elimination of higher order aberrations, but it was a reduced induction of spherical aberration. So that's a, a very important difference. Uh, wavefront optimized uh, treatments, the aim is to control the amount of spherical aberration. Um, but this, on the other hand, influence the other higher order aberrations. And we have topographic guided uh, ablations. And uh, this is uh, most useful where refractive error matches its topography. So if you see some kind of topography errors which fits to the refractive error, topographic guided ablations are recommended. In my experience, I also did a lot of topography guided treatments, but it's kind of a black box. You not really know what the laser is really doing. So uh, that's my experience um, to uh, choose very uh, crucial which kind of ablation you go for. The indication, and these are the German recommendations of the German Society of Refractive Surgery. Yeah, you're right, the German laws are very strict. So basically, myopia up to minus eight, astig medicine up, up to five diopters, and hypoopia plus three. But there is kind of a borderline, so where they're saying it's not suggested, but you're allowed to, so to speak. Myopia up to minus 10, astig medicine up to six, and hypoopia up to plus four. We heard a lot about exclusion criteria in refractive surgery and laser vision correction. I think most of them is clear. Just want to point out that the PTA is an important parameter, which is, in my hands, uh, pretty underestimated. Um, severe dry eye, it's uh, specifically for LASIK patients. You should really rule them out. And you have to keep in mind what are you doing with the shape of the cornea. So one diopter flattens the cornea by a factor 0.8. So keep in mind that you don't make the cornea too flat or the other way around, not make it too steep to create an, an apical scar. What are specific exclusion criteria? Of course, parchymetry below 480. Borderline topographies, there's this Randleman scheme. You're familiar with that. It's um, a, a very good suggestion you should uh, Look at that. 
uh, eye rubbing. So if a patient suffers from near-term mitis or allergies, whatever, uh, it may not be a good candidate for, for LASIK. And of course, some anatomical challenging situations like deep orbit and prominent nose. So it might be difficult to get a proper position for the femtosecond laser treatment. Corneal vascularizations, of course, and probably a small white to white, so very small eyes, so the femtosecond laser might get in trouble then. So the results, I uh, don't want to spend too much time if, uh, about the results because you're familiar with that. In this uh, meta-analysis, they included about uh, 60, 70,000 eyes. It's uh, more or less from the US, so you will see that the, most of the treatments were, were done with the WISX laser. Um, but I want to point out that the results uh, are pretty good. So the efficacy, people reaching uncorrected distance with acuity of 2020 or better was more than 90%. And also the predictability was very good. So more than 90% were within plus minus 0.5 diopters. Um, the safety, I think you're, you also know that we uh, have um, a very um, low complication rate, and only one, sorry, only 0.61% have a loss of uh, two or more lines. So this is a very high safety um, factor. Although 1.2% of all the LASIK patients are not happy, so they're dissatisfied. But still, it's a pretty good result. What are the pros and cons for LASIK? So pro, we can treat every kind of refractive error. Myopia, hypopia, astic medicine. Presbyopia, I have a talk tomorrow, I think. We can use customized ablations. It's uh, very easy to enhance uh, residual refractive errors. We have a very quick visual rehabilitation and it's painless. It's not on the list here, but it's a major difference to the uh, PRK or surface ablation. Of course, we have to deal with dry eye, and I'll show you some study in a minute. We have to deal with flap complications, although the femtosecond laser really uh, make it now very, very safe. We have a higher risk, a significant higher risk compared to other procedures as PRK and SMILE. I'll show you the study later. And we have, uh, there are two laser platforms necessary. So here are the study of the dry eye. Uh, it's a, a meta-analysis. And they found out that there is a significant reduction in tear film production after femtosecond LASIK, and there was no significant reduction in tear film production in PRK and SMILE. So this was a significant difference, and this is, to be honest, also my personal experience because I switched to SMILE, and the patients have a shorter period problems with dry. Um, the reason for that could, could you go back again? Yeah, the reason for that might be that the smile ablation or the removal of the tissue is deeper than in LASIK. So in LASIK you cut the anterior part which is more dense and uh, this might be a negative uh, effect on the sensitivity. What about ectasia after laser vision correction or after uh, um, LASIK? So uh, in this review they found out that after LASIK approximately 0.1% um, will develop ectasia, which is compared to PRK or SMILE, 4 to 4.5 times higher. So this is significantly higher, and uh, SMILE and PRK seem to be pretty similar. But in this meta-analysis, of course, they have not the same amount of eyes, so um, this might be a weak point of this study. The summary, LASIK is a safe and effective procedure. It's still the most popular refractive procedure worldwide. You have the full range of correction. We can use a, a customized ablation. Consider post-operative dry eye syndrome. This could be really a pain. You all know these patients. Um, um, sitting, uh, spend a lot of chair time with them. Uh, respect the limits. So really uh, uh, don't go over uh, the recommended limits. Uh, the enhancements are pretty easy, and the technique is still evolving. So we have presbyopic profiles and probably soon some ray tracing based ablations. So we are looking forward to that. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Martin.